Hey guys, it's Max. Welcome to my review of the all around best hybrid camera ever. Not the best mirrorless hybrid camera or the best full frame hybrid camera, which are both titles that have given in the past, but the single best hybrid camera ever. And I'll explain why in just a bit. If you guys enjoy those shots, please give this video a like. And I do want to mention, just in case you guys didn't see the title, that I am mainly going to be focusing on video. But with that said, this thing is an excellent photo camera. And like I mentioned, it's the best hybrid camera. It's kind of like if the A9 and the A7R3 got together, had a baby. The baby was a lot less expensive, but had the capabilities of close to the capabilities of these much higher end, more expensive cameras. We have the autofocus system from the A9, but with way more contrast detection points. And then we also have uh, the dynamic range from the A7R3 actually slightly better. And I think this is the best dynamic range camera that Sony has put out. It is really, really good. For a price tag, that's $1,200 less than the A7R3 and $2,500 less than the A9. And this is why this camera is getting so much buzz. I do wanna mention that I have links to this camera and the lenses that I used in the video description. So make sure you guys go and check that out. Along with that, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button and enable those notifications so you guys don't miss out on future videos. I'll give you guys a couple seconds here. And now that you've done that, if you're interested in my a7 III for video shooters Facebook group, you guys can go check it out and join by following the link in the video description. So there's really no new great revolutionary outstanding features in this camera compared to the a7R 3 or the A9 for video shooters. Uh, there's no 4K 60, we don't have 10 bit. Hopefully we get at least one of those in the a7S 3 but that's okay. The main reason that this camera is getting so much buzz and there's so much people commenting about it in various Facebook groups. Uh, a lot of people are annoyed on the Fuji groups, on the Panasonic groups. And the main reason why a lot of people have pre-ordered it, including myself, is because Sony is not holding back with the feature set. And because of that, there's even some A9 and A7R 3 people that are upset by the release of this camera. I for one applaud Sony for giving us their all, pushing out new technology and offering it out to the world. If you're one of the people that are upset, keep in mind how long you're able to use your previous camera, may hopefully make money from it if you're doing it or just enjoy it and capture shots of your family. That's something you can't get back if you would have waited another uh, nine, 10 months or three months from the previous camera launches. Now on top of that, those cameras are still higher end and they do have some features or some capabilities that the a7 III does not. With that said, the a7 III has enough features, more than enough for the vast majority of shooters, and that's why this thing is getting pre-ordered like crazy. Back to video, I really like the image and capabilities that I get from my previous Sonys. Great low light, autofocus, dynamic range, slow motion, audio preamps, and a lot more. Now all of these features are available on the Sony a6300 that sells for I think $900 right now. But the main reason that I pre-ordered it and I'm planning to buy another one is because of the ergonomic and the usability upgrades with these third generation bodies. Those have been the biggest downfalls of the camera and now we finally have most of those issues fixed. It's not perfect, but it's way better. And if you're a professional making money with these cameras, these are things that you're really going to appreciate. We have the upgraded body design with slightly improved menus, and then on top of that, the My Menu function, which allows you to pick out the features that you often go and select and put it in its separate category to make it much quicker and easier to use. On top of that, we have sunny mode when you're shooting 4K video and 1080p at 120 FPS, which was a horrible downside of the previous Sony cameras. You go outside to shoot, you start recording 4K, the screen dims incredibly uh, low, and you can't see anything. So just like with the A9 and the A7R3, 
this is fixed. I was shooting outside in the desert yesterday and it was high noon out and I had no problem seeing the rear LCD, which is awesome. On top of that, we have a larger battery that gives us much better battery life, which I'll touch on in just a bit. We also have more and better buttons and dual card slots, which is great if you wanna do backup recording. If you're shooting something important like a wedding or some other event where you can't risk having a memory card go out. Sony didn't hold anything back compared to the excellent R3 in regards to video. We still have all the profiles, we still have the headphone jack, we have the 4K, the 1080p at 120. They're just giving us everything that they have to offer, which is awesome and refreshing from a company. Let's start talking about 4K video quality. The a7 III pulls a 6K image from the sensor and super samples that to 4K. This results in a great image like the a6500. We do have a small crop when shooting 4K 30, which I wish we didn't have, roughly 1.2 crop, but that is acceptable. It's better than like the 1DX Mark II, a lot of the other Canons, and in general, the DSLRs that shoot 4K. Since this camera has a 24 megapixel sensor, you're able to use the APS-C crop mode and still get really good looking 4K. And I'll show you guys the side-by-sides in just a bit. I love this flexibility about Sony cameras. Instead of a Canon forcing me to go into a crop mode or more than that type of a crop, I can shoot full frame, get a great image. And then if I wanna get better reach, get closer to a subject, I'm able to do so with just a tap of a button and all my primes effectively become two different focal lengths. My zooms have a lot more more reach and if you're coming from a crop sensor body like a 6000 6500 you're able to use all of those lenses on this camera and still get great results not having to upgrade your lenses right away which is really nice if you also have lenses like the sigma 18 to 35 which is an amazing lens i love that lens you're able to use that on this camera and get fantastic looking images on top of that, we have clear image zoom, which basically allows you to zoom in as you're recording from the full frame up to 1.5 times in the full frame mode. And so you can get a little closer, get a little bit further. Uh, and this also helps out doing macro is because uh, your minimal focusing distance stays the same, but you get closer to your subject. You can surprisingly also put it into the APS-C crop mode, which uses just over 4K worth of data. And you can still clear image zoom 1.5 times, but I would be careful with this because uh, the camera, if you go in the APS-C crop and then one point times clear image zoom. Uh, and great lighting might look good. The camera's doing some uh, sampling and uh, making the pixels kind of larger to make it a 4K image. But if you're in low light, I would not uh, recommend using this mode. But in a pinch, if you need to get close to your subject, you basically have a two times crop factor if you want it. Here's a 4K side by side comparing the full frame and super 35 mode. And the quality is surprisingly similar and good to medium lighting conditions, even though the crop mode isn't oversampled very much. Now let's compare the a7III's image to the a7R3, the a6500, and the GH5. All of these cameras do a great job in 4K and all of them are oversampling either 5 or 6K worth of data. We're going to take a look at the detail inside that square kind of shrub, also the subway tiles inside of the pool. Punching into 200%, we can see that the a7 III is in first place, followed by the a6500, which also oversamples 6K into 4K. Then we have the a7R III, and lastly we have the GH5. And on the GH5, if you look at the pool, it's very hard to notice those subway tiles. They're kind of blurred out, whereas on the Sonys, it's easier to notice them, especially on the a7 III, which has the most detail out of the bunch. With this 6K oversampling, how is the rolling shutter? Well, it's not great, but it's not too bad. The a7R III was the best Sony I've ever tested in regards to rolling shutter, and the a7 III is a bit worse, but it's nowhere near as bad as the a6500 that also oversamples 6K. If I had to guess, I would say it's quite similar to the a7S II and the a9. Compared to the GH5, the Panasonic still takes the lead with its very minimal rolling shutter. All of these shots have been in full frame 4K, but I should mention that once we go into the Super 35 mode, the rolling shutter reduces greatly. And when you put it side by side and overlay it over the GH5, it is almost identical. That is really great because the GH5 has basically class leading rolling shutter. So with these tests, I would suggest if you're shooting something where you're riding in a car and you're recording outside of the car, you're doing fast pans following sports action, I would be shooting in the Super 35 mode. Taking a look at 1080p rolling shutter, it is very minimal, and comparing it to the Panasonic, it is quite similar. Now the a7 III also has 1080p at up to 120 frames per second with audio and full video autofocus that tracks incredibly well.
These shots are with an 85mm f1.8 in Super 35 mode, so it's almost 130mm equivalent. The dune buggies are coming from very far away, and the camera is tracking them at such a shallow depth of field perfectly. We also have the ability to use the APS-C crop mode in 1080p, even the 120 frames per second, but should you? Looking at these side by side, we can tell that the full frame mode does have more detail and less aliasing, especially if you look at the top of the building. Punching in, we definitely notice more detail, less aliasing. Now at 60, it basically looks the same, and I'm not seeing a big difference. And once again, you see all that aliasing on the little foxtail logo there. And now looking at 1080p at 120 frames per second, the quality looks similar with the full frame once again leading. And here, the Super 35 mode definitely has more aliasing. Unfortunately, a lot of my 120 FPS shots were using the APS-C crop mode for the better reach, but now that I know that the full frame mode does look quite a bit better, I'm going to stick with using the full frame. Here's full frame 1080p 24 FPS versus 120, and I wanted to see how much detail loss we get if we shoot in super slow motion, and surprisingly, it looks about the same. Sony has been known for having quite soft 1080p, and that was a huge complaint with the a6300 and the a6500 and a lot of other previous cameras. Panasonic has always had great 1080p, and with the a7R3, we finally started to see Sony catching up. Let's see how the a7 III compares. Looking at these closely side by side, the GH5 is definitely in first place at 1080p at 24, followed closely by the a7 III and then the a7R III and the a6500 in last place. Switching to 60p, we don't see much of a difference surprisingly, the result is the same. But once we step up to 120 frames per second, the GH5's quality drops down where the a7III's and a7R3's stays the same. Looking at a 200% crop, the a6500 is still in last place, followed by the GH5, then the a7R3, and in first place, the a7III. More and more pros are starting to use video autofocus now that it's getting so good. There's multiple scenarios where I really appreciate having video autofocus. One is like this, where I'm shooting in full frame with an 85 millimeter at f1.8, and it's doing all the autofocus by itself. So this whole video, you guys have been watching me shooting super shallow, like this background is not very far away from me, but it's all blurred out, and the camera is tracking my face. So let me know in the comment section below how well it's been doing. Now, I've tested out a bunch of different uh, Sony cameras and different lenses, and it really does a great job. It's not not always perfect, but it's so close uh, that it's definitely usable and it does a better job than I could do if I was behind the camera shooting an interview and trying to control it. Usually in a scenario like this, especially on a full frame, you'd stop down to like an f2.8 at least or an f4. That way when the person's moving back and forth a bit or they adjust, they're not going to go out of focus. But now with these new cameras, we have the capability to shoot wide open and get great shots with nice shallow depth of field, allowing you just to be more creative. The other time where I really like having video autofocus is when I'm shooting on a gimbal. Previously with my glide cam, I always had to shoot with a wide lens, stop it down to get a wide depth of field, and also try to keep a distance to my subject. Now I can shoot with a f1.8, a 55, or even an 85 millimeter on a gimbal and have it being able to track my subject no matter if I'm moving or if they're moving or if we're both moving. We also have the massive boom of vloggers and video autofocus is so helpful in that scenario. The a7R3 works quite well in most scenarios, but it did seem a bit slower than the a9 for fast moving object. The a7R3 works just as fast as the a9. You can let the camera track the object and then slow it down and you have the shot mostly or all completely in focus, which is just incredible. This is something you would not be able to do without a camera that has this good of autofocus. Now let's talk about a question that I probably got more than any other, and that is overheating. I did test out this camera, I shot it for around an hour and a half, mostly inside of my hotel room, which I kept quite warm at 76 degrees, and a little bit inside a different room, which is probably like 71, 72, and it had no issues whatsoever. So I wish I could have tested it longer, but we had to go out and shoot and stuff like that. 
but after an hour and a half, I did not even get the high temperature logo. And this was with the camera set to standard heat mode, not the high heat mode that allows the camera to heat up hotter before it shuts off on you. I also have to mention that touching the camera after an hour and a half of continuous 4K recording, that's with the IBIS turned on and with the video autofocus and I'm holding it and moving it around uh, to make sure there's some stuff going on, uh, the camera did not even get hot. My A6500 on the other hand, after 15 minutes, it is quite hot already to the touch, way hotter than this A7 III after an hour and a half. So I don't think these cameras are gonna have any overheating issues. Um, with that said, I talked to some Japanese engineers from Sony and what they mentioned, they kind of confirmed my suspicion, is that the A9, the A7R3, and now the A7 III are using newer generation processors uh, that are much more efficient, they use much less energy, and because of that, they put out less heat. If you guys watch my videos based on like the A6300 and the A7R2, I mentioned that we're probably gonna have to wait for Sony to use more efficient and have newer processors uh, to make use of because of how small these bodies are and how packed in they are with tech compared to the competition, putting in a processor that's oversampling 6K, which most people don't do, puts out a ton of heat. So I think this issue is finally solved. I've been shooting with my A7R3 since that camera came out, and I haven't even seen the overheating logo once, and that's shooting a ton and really long videos as well. So I do not think it's gonna be an issue. I mean, we still have to see if we're shooting outside in 100 degrees, bright sunlight, how that's gonna perform. But I think for most people, overheating is not gonna be an issue. Now let's move right into battery life. And this camera has that new Z battery, which I was really hoping they would put into this camera. I was really hoping they wouldn't get rid of the dual card slots or that battery just for their lower end line like some other K manufacturers would do. They did not, and it does not disappoint. Sony was actually saying that this is gonna have the best battery life out of any one of their previous cameras, especially for still shots, which I think I shot like 3000 on the A9 and I still had like 20, 30% battery life. It was incredible. But in regards to video, when I was doing that overheating test, I recorded for one and a half hours straight in 4K with the IBIS turned on, and it only used 50% battery life after an hour and a half, meaning we should get roughly three hours on a single battery, which is incredible. I mean, it's so nice. It's been so nice shooting with the A7R 3 That gets about two and a half, so I don't know what they changed here. It's using more data for the 4K, but it looks like we're getting roughly three hours of battery life, which is awesome. The previous Sony's had like 50 minutes to an hour, maybe an hour and five minutes and you're done. And that is so limiting and it's really nice to have a battery, just a couple batteries for an all day shoot and you're set. Now let's move on to another question I get asked quite a bit, and that is the IBIS, in-body image stabilization. So these Sonys are great because they have that built in, even though they're so small and they have full frame sensors, but the Sonys were never great, especially if you're walking. Uh, you don't have that much room for the sensor to move around inside of these bodies, and I think that's why the Panasonics have been killing Sony. Now the A7R 3 was the first camera where I saw a noticeable improvement while I'm walking. Uh, it still doesn't look great, and if you guys look at the A7 III side by side, it looks fairly similar. Maybe the A7 III is slightly better, uh, but it's not great when compared to like the GH5. Now I did also test it just hand holding, and this is around 70 millimeter equivalent, and the GH5 is still smoother, but the Sony doesn't do too bad. And this is more of a scenario where I like to use the IBIS if I'm doing some hand holding. I want a little bit of motion there. I don't really want a locked off tripod shot or else I'd use a tripod most of the time. So you have a little bit of motion, it's nice and smooth. So these shots that you guys are seeing right here, uh, that's me holding two cameras at once, one on top of each other. So with both cameras, we'd get slightly better results if I was just holding one of them, and if it wasn't after me walking a bunch with these cameras. Personally, if you're doing walking shots, I would highly suggest using a gimbal. It's more comfortable to use. It allows you to mimic different uh, shots and you can be really creative with it. And on top of that, you get much smoother footage while walking compared to even the GH5, which has an excellent IBIS system. If you guys wanna see how uh, a, cam a Sony camera on a gimbal compares to like the GH5's IBIS, you guys could click this card above and check it out uh, or click on the card at the end of the video and see that. Uh, the gimbal still gives you better results and I much prefer you using that. Do I wish we could have the IBIS from the GH5 in a Sony? Definitely, but you gotta keep in mind, the GH5 is larger than even this full frame Sony camera. It has so much room inside that body with this micro four thirds sensor. The sensor can walk, move around a ton if you open it up and look inside, compared to the Sony's where it's impressive that they even crammed it in there. 
So let's start wrapping this up, talking about low light performance, and in this regard, I was very impressed with the a7 III, and in my side-by-side -side shots, what I took away from that is that this is Sony's second best low light performer, uh, second to the a7S II, and I honestly think, and I can't prove this because I don't have an a7S II to test it side-by-side, -side. I tried to get one, I couldn't get one, uh, but comparing it to that camera from my previous experiences, I think this is cleaner if you're shooting 6400 or below low because of that 6K oversampling. Now I think 12,800 is probably where they're about even and then above that the a7S II starts taking the lead. But for most people you don't really need to go that high. And I honestly think that the a7S III is going to employ a 24 megapixel sensor. It could even be this exact sensor for the oversampling capabilities and the APS-C crop. Who knows, Sony may stick with the 12 megapixel, but it's so convenient to have that crop option. Now let's take a look at some side-by-side -side comparisons with the a7R3, the a6500, and the GH5. So starting off here at 1600, uh, the Sony's all look super clean. The GH5 still looks really clean too, but you do notice some noise in the shadows and a little bit on the face that might be lost by the time it hits YouTube. 3200, man, they're all clean other than the GH5 where you start seeing noise creep up in uh, the jeans, the shirt, the face, the background. Here at 6400, our A7 III is still insanely clean. I'm starting to pick up some noise on the A7R III in the face. Uh, and the A6500 is getting even more noisy than the A7R3. Uh, and of course, the GH5 is not really great looking. It's not really usable, in my opinion, at that point. And then at 12,800 ISO, the A7 III is still ridiculously clean. This thing's impressive. The A7R3 is usable. The A6500 is usable if you need to get the shot. Uh, but definitely in third place, and of course the GH5 just fell apart. 25,600, the GH5 is gone, and man, the a7 III is clean. a7R III, it's usable. It's usable if you need to get the shot. a6500 at this point um, is not usable. Like I mentioned previously, I was able to talk with some of the Sony engineers from Japan, which is great that they're on these trips, and they gave me a couple different pointers about some questions that you guys had. First off, the flip screen. I asked them about it once again. I typically do it at almost every one of these events, and they were honestly surprised at the need. I was kind of explaining them that there's no vlog camera that shoots 4K, uh, that also has great autofocus and a flip out screen and a small form factor. So they're taking notes, they're gonna bring them back. They didn't give me a reason why it doesn't have it, uh, and they kind of act like they were surprised that it's such a big need in the market and a lot of people want it. Hopefully this means that they're gonna put out something with a flip screen. In the past, they've listened to multiple ideas that I, along with other press, have brought up. Uh, like one, for example, is uh, the large battery or like the touch screens. That was one thing we kept asking them about, moving the record button over to the side. They kind of weren't sure if that was a big deal or they didn't think it was a big deal until it was brought up. Uh, so they do listen and that is great. So hopefully we will get a flip out screen. Another question was the Play Memories app, and this has been coming up ever since uh, the A9 came out. And with each camera release, people ask, is they're gonna get the app back? No, we don't think they're gonna get it back. That's what they're saying. They explained to me the reason why, and it's because these newer cameras have a new processor that's much more efficient, and it actually uses a different architecture type. Uh, and because of that, the previous apps are not, uh, they don't work with this camera, basically. If they wanted to have the Play Memories app system and those apps, they would have to be completely rewritten for these new chipsets. And what they said is they looked at the market, they looked at how much people actually use it on their cameras, and it was very, very low. And because of that, they decided to put the resources and the time into developing other things. So it does not look like we're gonna get that back. Hopefully they put some features back, like time-lapse into the actual camera itself without the Play Memories app, but having it in there uh, instead of having to use a remote. I also asked them about that 30 minute recording limit and I mentioned how the Panasonic GH line has the great advantage of recording continuously uh, without having to hit record again and stopping after 30 minutes. I asked them if they're ever willing to remove it and if there's a reason why they're putting it in. They mentioned the EU tax laws, which we've all heard about, but I asked them, well, we're in the US here in the States. A lot of my audiences, I'm in the States, why do we still have the limit here? They said technically there's no reason for it. They would just have to make uh, different like serial numbers for cameras, basically make two different models, one for Europe, one for United States. Then they would not have that limit. 
but it's just, I don't know, they haven't wanted to do it or they haven't had the resources, basically they have not done it. Uh, so I expressed that I wanted it to have no recording limit, that would give them another kind of advantage in the market, uh, but they did mention one interesting thing. They told me that in 2019, that EU tax law is either gonna expire or it's gonna get removed. Uh, I don't remember the exact way they phrased it, but that EU tax law is gonna be gone and we are gonna be able to have recording limits over 30 minutes without a camera being classified as you know, a camcorder or a video camera. So I let them know like, hey, when that happens, make sure you guys get rid of this 30 minute limit. Your cameras are no longer having these overheating issues, so it shouldn't be a problem in that aspect. And they were quite uh, happy hearing that. They took down their notes. So hopefully with the next generation of Sony cameras, we won't have that 30 minute limit anymore. So let's finish this off and answer the question, should you buy an a7 III? Well, if you're already shooting with a Sony, maybe a crop body or a second generation Sony camera like the R2, the S2, or the a7 II, and you wanna get a little bit more upgrades, you want all the benefits of this newer body, absolutely you should upgrade. Uh, there's so much ergonomics and uh, usability upgrades. The body's better, the buttons are better, the autofocus is way better, a lot less slowdowns between the menu systems, uh, the dynamic range if you're shooting photos is better, you have all the picture profiles, you have 4K, you have 1080p at 120 with no crop, uh, no screen dimming, no overheating, three hours of battery life, uh, and that goes along with all the great things, like I mentioned in the beginning of this video, that the Sony's had to offer in terms of video. So it really takes what Sony was great at, and it puts into a body that's usable, that's not gonna overheat, and that's just gonna get the job done, which is the main reason why I'm so excited uh, to get my hands on it. On top of that, they're charging $2,000. You look at the competition, this thing's basically killing it in photo and in video. 10 frames per second, the buffer is larger, great autofocusing, all the video features that just don't compare to those other cameras, and you even compare it to like a 5D Mark IV, and it's basically better in every single way way for $2,000. So I've even seen people saying they're gonna sell their Canons, their 5D Mark IVs, a lot of people with 60, 60 Mark IIs, but even 5D Mark IVs and saying they're gonna switch over here. And it's funny that Sony is calling it their basic camera because the specs really say otherwise. And a lot of people who are already using a7R3s and A9s, this camera will serve them just as well. Now, if you're somebody that bought one of those cameras and you're wondering how it compares as far as the features, what are the differences, and what are you spending that extra money for, I'm gonna have another video talking specifically about that because I know that's a big topic that's being brought up right now. So in general, if you're interested in a Sony, this thing is the way to go for almost everybody. Dynamic range, uh, as far as we've seen here, and Rishi from DP Review is going over the numbers and the tests with me, it's the best Sony, even beating by about a third of a stop, the a7R III, which is impressive. You have better autofocusing in that camera. And for most people, 24 megapixels is enough. So I think this camera, like I mentioned multiple times, is gonna sell really well. It might be the first Sony that's just gonna hit mass market hard and get them to that number one spot as far as full frame sales. So thank you guys for watching. If you guys have any questions, make sure to ask in that comment section below. Once again, I have links to this camera, to the lenses I use, and the link to the Facebook group as well if you guys wanna go join there. Enable notifications, I will be making more videos on this camera in the near future. Thank you for watching, this has been Max, and I will see you in the next video.